All right, Lord, we love you and we thank you for this day. We pray and believe as we come before you that, Holy Spirit, you're here and that you move throughout this congregation. I uh, believe that people have ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts to understand what you bring out. Um, ministering spirits, angels, we just invite you to be a part of our, our service. We ask and believe that you'd, min- that you'd walk through the, the, uh, the service, through the building, and just minister to people. I think healing is going to come to people, brightness of mind. I think your hearts are going to be healed. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I always want to invite Holy Spirit to be here. You know, in, in Revelation, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Where's he knocking? He's knocking on the front door of the church. A lot of churches won't let Jesus in. You know, if you don't let Holy Spirit in, you're not fully letting Jesus in because he sent Holy Spirit to live with us. So anyway, this morning I want to talk to you about something I think is one of the most neglected areas. And welcome if you're online. Uh, we're, we're streaming now and that's going good. And so if you're online, welcome. Glad you're here. Um, one of the most neglected things I think that one of the powerful things you can do to receive from God and enter into all God has for you is to live a lifestyle of gratitude and thanksgiving. Now, I know we're in the month where we're coming up on Thanksgiving. And sadly, though, lots of people wait till Thanksgiving to sit around a table and tell each other what they're thankful for. I'm telling you, this should be an everyday thing for families. For Christians, this should be an everyday event. We shouldn't wait until a particular day of the year. You know, I love holidays. I, I mean, Christmas is my favorite. Trent and I have put, actually Trent did most of it, uh, put uh, Christmas lights up this year. We already have them up. And, um, I, and every year we go bigger and we get, I don't say better, maybe more gaudy. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we're trying to figure out a few more to put up. But I love the these times of the year, but just because it's Christmas doesn't mean it's the only time you give. It's the only time that you get together. It's important that we as a church are always giving to each other, that we're always thankful and grateful for each other. So I just want to throw that out there. I want to, uh, I I, I read the, this is a laminated copy of scriptures that I read uh, while I'm waiting to come out sometimes. I just encourage myself. How many of you know if sometimes you're the best encouragement you can get? So um, the, the word says in Psalms that David encouraged himself when he was down, when he was out, he encouraged himself. But it, it says, I just want to read the first scripture to you. It's in Acts 20, 27. It says, for I never shrank back or kept back or fell short from declaring to you the whole purposes and plan and counsel of God. That's the Amplified, and Paul was speaking there. I just want you to know that here at this church, we, we seek to not just talk about the fun stuff, but and fun stuff's great. But it's important to talk about things that are challenging. It's important to talk about things that people are having problems with. And because it gets us further. And, it, you know, church is actually, <clears throat> if church is done right, it should be in addition to what you're already doing. Yes. Not the only thing you're doing. Yes. And, you know, it, well, I'm not going to get on that. I'll get on a soapbox and won't ever get to a message. So I just want to encourage you this morning as we get into this to, just to be open. Um, I want to read Psalm 46, 1 to you. They don't have to, I just want you to listen to it. This is in the Amplified. It says, God is our refuge and strength, mighty and impenetrable to temptation, a very present and well-proved help in trouble. Has anybody ever been in trouble? You know, what you do when you get in trouble is what, what you'll do before you got in trouble. If you've been in the Word before you got in trouble... You'll get in the word when you get in trouble. If you haven't been in the word before you got in trouble, well, you'll probably still get in the word and try to get your way out. That's when a lot of deals are made with God. I saw something funny. Um, It was uh, the Cubs just won the World Series. And I don't follow sports really, but I know since 1918 or something like that since they won. I mean, that's a long, that's almost 100 years. Talk about a losing streak. 108. Well, what, okay, well, anyway, it's been a long time. Anyway, <laughs> I was just starting doing math. But anyway, um, if, and it's, there was some pastor put this out on his billboard. He said, hey, just in case you made a deal with God, you need to keep it this morning. You know, it was a Sunday coming up. And if they made it, if God, if you let the Cubs win, I'll go to church the rest of my life. You know, people do that. It has nothing to do with this message. God is a refuge and strength, mighty and penetrable to temptation, very present help 
and well proved in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains be shaken into the midst of the seas, though it, its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling and tumult, Selah. When you read Psalms and you see the word Selah, it means stop and calmly think about this. Stop and calmly think about this. Then he goes on to say, There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. I'm telling you, we're that stream. We are one of those streams of the river of God. We should be going out into our city and making it glad because of the words and the actions that align with his kingdom. Amen? Um, I want to go to uh, the first scripture in this message this morning. is Psalm 37. And uh, I want to tell you real quick, I was talking to Amy the other day, and, um, you know, I've kind of come to a place in my life, I wrote a, an article not long, well, it's, it's been about a year ago, called Destined for Difficulty. And what I realized is that if you're going to live a Christian life and somebody told you that it's easy, they were liars from the pit of hell, and you should go back and find them and minister love to them. Um, but the Christian life's not easy, but it's well worth it. I, you couldn't pay me large amounts of money to go back to where I was. I mean, I remember where I was. I went not long ago, a few weeks ago, and met Pastor Bob Nichols for lunch. And we met in Cowtown. I don't really ever go to Cowtown anymore because I used to work there. I worked in a couple of bars. I, bound, I, I helped with security and stuff like that. And I saw the bad side of it. I saw people die in the alleys. And uh, it, was a, it was a bad place. But once you have come into God, I just don't understand why anybody would ever want to go back. And today I want to talk to you about thanksgiving and gratefulness. Gratefulness, I believe, is a past. It's an expression of past victory or past supply, while thanksgiving and praise are present future. It's what you're doing for the future. And if you, I don't think that if you're not a grateful person, you won't be a praising person. You have to become grateful before you can truly praise because praising is believing that what the same thing that happened before, what you're grateful for, will happen again in the future because you're giving God thanks and you're giving him glory for what he did. Everyone in here this morning, you may say, well, I don't have anything to be grateful for. You're here. Your heart's beating. Your lungs are pumping. Your, your mind's working. That's, a, that's a, something extremely uh, big to be grateful for. There's a lot of people, you know, it's just one little shift in your mind and you're mentally in, incapacitated. It's like, it's almost like the mind is as in sync and balanced as the universe. The whole universe, God set in motion with light B. And when he did that, it is specific. Your mind is very specific. And we have so much to be grateful for. In Psalm 37, 5, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. I love that. Feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. It says he shall bring it to pass. But when you delight yourself in the Lord, the word delight actually means to become pliable. It means to become moldable, to come into his way of thinking. And when you delight yourself in him or become pliable to him, your way of thinking starts lining up with his way of thinking. That's what repent actually means. Repentance means return to the penthouse or return to the high place to see. You know, we've been seated with him in heavenly places at the right hand of majesty. Most Christians only see this way instead of going up and seeing this way. See, right now, you know, we, we are... In, some of you don't know, but we're in the middle of looking for property and doing some other things and um, believe in God for increase and all this kind of stuff. You can't believe in a good future without a good God for the future. Yeah. And so many people just look, they look, um, they look on a linear uh, basis, only what they can see around them. And they base everything about their future on a linear past or what's happened in the past. And most of the time, if they're not seeking God for the future, their past, even while there's good things in it, they only draw on the negative for the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Because the mind in and of itself always goes negative. Yeah. It always does. Let's kick the fans on to keep make sure the, the air still circulating. I just heard them click off. Just the fans, though. I don't want to freeze up here. Um, but you have to learn to see from God's perspective. 
And let's go to Hebrews 3.14. Hebrews 3.14. Let me, let me say this to you. The entirety of your life is wrapped up in the Godhead. And because we live from the unseen to the seen, we learn to be thankful even in the hard times, grateful for what he's done and expectant about what he'll do. I am eternally grateful to God. Somebody, I don't even know who did this. Every, every time I come out, I take communion before I speak on, during first service. But somebody gave me a picture of Jesus. I don't, I don't know which one. It was Debbie. Um, it, was, it was one, um, was Debbie Glenn? Yeah. Oh, how sweet. Where is she? Is she here? Okay. Anyway, it's the one that that little girl drew where Jesus has green eyes. And it, it looks really, and every time that I, I take communion, I look at that now. So I'm so grateful for that picture. It just it adds another layer to the, the realness of taking communion. But see, if you, if you, if you don't, appreciate what God has done and what people do for you, you're going to have a miserable life. Gratefulness is the, you need to live from a place of gratefulness. I think God, I, I memorialize my life. Everything about my life is memorialized. I have a, let me sit, let me come back to that. I want to talk about a knife. Remind me of that. But I, I, uh, I want to make clear God praising God Giving God thanksgiving and gratefulness are not keys to increase your wallet. They're not keys to get what you want. However, if you praise God and are grateful to him, you'll get what you want yeah. because he's a good God. But it can't be your motive because yeah. things can't sustain you. Yeah. However, things can contain love given to you. Yeah. And so on my, I have a table in my office that's got a bunch of knives on it. I have yet to make a, a thing to set them all on. And there's one knife in particular that's in there. I don't think the guy's in here that's get, that gave it to me. But um, guy, it was a custom knife that was made for me. And it sits there. And probably once or twice, maybe three times a week, I go to this table and I look at it. And I'll just look at that one. I look at one my dad gave me. It was a, a Skinner, a buffalo knife. And I look at those and I, while it's a thing and it'll all burn with fervent heat, we, I'm not taking it with me to heaven. So, no, it doesn't, that thing does not have eternal value. But who gave that thing has great eternal value. Yeah. And that they gave it to me. And one person that gave me the custom made one said, I, I just wanted to honor you. Because I, they just want to honor you. And so I had this made for you. And I look at that. And it always, and it always, it always brings me a place to, of humility, too. Because if you're grateful, you're humble. Yeah. And I'm not even, I'm even off from the first service because... This is part of next week's message, but leading a life of gratitude means leading a life of humility, thankful that somebody else made up for your insufficiency. Every one of us are insufficient in some area, but God, he makes up the difference or he sends somebody to you to help make up the difference. Amen. Psalm 37, we said that. That word delight there means to make oneself pliable. Uh, it's an expression of ongoing love and trust in a cooperative relationship. Thanksgiving and praise is an expression of trust in an ongoing cooperative relationship. What I mean by that is if we truly trust God, we won't complain about the past or the present. We'll thank him for the future. Yeah, Sonny said something to me that Sabian told her. And I, I thought about it more, and I, I got a little bit more. But it was amazing because complaining and griping are connected to poverty. They're connected to poverty and lack. And let me see if I can find what I wrote down. Complaining comes from a place of poverty and lack and glorifies the stealer. John 10.10 10 says... The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. So anytime we complain or we get in doubt or fear, we're actually glorifying the one of fear. And when we complain, oh, I don't know how we're going to make it. Uh, I'm going to have more month than money. When you think these ways and you continually say these things, you're developing dominant thought patterns of your life that are highways to bring about the physical likeness of what you think. Man, I always need money. I need more money. I need more money. I need, you're saying this all the time. You'll put yourself to forever need more money. Yeah. You should be saying, I got plenty of money. Yeah. I'm overabundantly supplied. Yeah. 
You, you may say, Barry, that's just the stupidest thing I've ever heard because I look at my checkbook. Yeah, well, maybe you shouldn't every day. It probably hasn't changed. So maybe what you should do is close it, look at it, and say, you're full in Jesus' name. People are like, well, yeah, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Man, You don't talk to your checkbook. It's inanimate. You talk to your car when it won't start, except you usually cuss it. You sorry, son, you know, you know, you know where I'm going. You know. There's a, this service isn't going right. But anyway, there's this joke. And this guy comes into a pet store. And uh, there's a parrot at the front of the store. He walks in and the parrot says to the guy, you're the ugliest guy I've ever seen. The guy turns and looks at him. What? The parrot says, you are the ugliest man I've ever seen in my life. He looks back at him. He's just, he's just in shock that the parrot's talking to him. And he goes up to the owner and he says, I want to tell you something. I walk in here and your parrot just told me I'm the ugliest person he's ever seen in his life. And the shop, oh, so I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. That parrot, he's, he's rebellious and he, he won't listen to me and he won't do what I tell him to do. And he goes up there and he takes the parrot out, slaps it across the face, throws it back in the cage, feathers flying everywhere. Show you, you be nice to people when they come out. Come in. The guy shops around a little bit, walks out. As he's walking out, he stops and looks at the parrot. The parrot looks at him and says, you know. <laughs> so when I talk about complaining and griping and the words that you use, you know. You know what you do better than anybody else. Don't I, and, and the thing is, um, when it says, uh, Hebrews 13, 14, let's just read it real quick. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continue to offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the, fir- the fruit of our lips. The sacrifice of praise to God. A praise is not sacrifice for something you already have. Yeah. Praise is only sacrifice when you're giving it for what you don't have. Or what, where you hadn't come to yet. And it says, that is the fruit of your lips. In other words, the words of your mouth. For the next two weeks, I'm encouraging everybody in church, don't complain. Don't use any negative words about yourself or anybody else. No words of complaining. We're fasting, complaining. And I guarantee you, if you fast this, if you really do it, and listen, if you mess up on day two, don't get all down the dumps and quit. Just Receive forgiveness and move on. But if you set your heart, you set your mind to not complain, I guarantee you into two weeks you feel better. Physically, you feel better. Your checkbook looks better. Even if it don't, it will. Because you'll look better. See, I looks everything. That's why thankful people live longer. Thankful people are fun to be around. Why? Because they're always thankful. Anyway, okay. And I'll, uh, don't, don't, don't let me forget testimonies, ammunition. Okay. Most stories come back to knives or guns with me. I'm just telling you, if it's your first time here, get used to it. Okay. Um, this is good. So it says, uh, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget, you know, people read that part and don't read on, but it's important. But do not forget to do good and to share. See, when God does something in your life, it's for one reason. It's for you because he loves you, but it's so you can share it with somebody else. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. There's a David principle. In the Old Testament, God told David, don't you ever number your troops. Don't let me forget the testimony thing. And the next scripture I'm going to is 1 Samuel 15.3. In the Old Testament, he says, don't number your troops. Why? Because David, he, David was a nobody at one time. He lived out in the hills. He lived in a cave. And when he was at, it was Adullam, the cave of Adullam. And all, it was about 300 or 400 men came to him and said, will you be our leader? Well, you think, well, that's pretty good. Except they were all broke. They were all distressed. Some of them were divorced. They were, in, they were in need. They were all broken up, jacked up guys. Yeah. And these, this is who God brings you. I want you to lead these people. 
Well, you may think, well, you know, that's better than nothing. Well, sometimes it's not. <laughs> you know, so, sometimes we, you know, I, God, bring us a few millionaires to church. Come on. But you know what? Lend, if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. Right. So I ain't worried about it. And some people in here are going to become millionaires. Amen. You're supposed to finance the kingdom of God. Yeah. There's some brilliant people in here. I mean, really brilliant, good ideas, people. But they come to David and they say that. And David says, all right, I'll be your leader. Did you know that those grew in to become the 700 mighty men? Some of those guys with, with just themselves and a sword would take out hundreds and thousands of opponents. One man. Why? Because a spirit of might would come upon them. See, in, in Isaiah it says that the things that are broken, the people that are destroyed will become oaks of righteousness and rebuild the city. So I think some of the best candidates to receive the spirit of might and the spirit of prosperity are those who've never had it. Because they'll take it and they'll run with it. So I want to, let me just get my notes. Oh, that's my scriptures. Well, what did I tell you? First Samuel 15. So sacrifice, it's given something. So what Daniel, David did is he numbered his troops even though he wasn't supposed to. You know, when you number your troops, then you trust in your troops. Yeah. When you're always looking at your checkbook, that's who you trust. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. And God's not going to give you, he's not going to bless you with so much that you put your trust in the thing he gives you. Yeah. That's right. You know, I'm, I, I am trying to learn quick not to put my trust in a savings account or in surplus. Amen. So I'll get more. Because when I get more, I don't put my trust in the thing. I, put my, I keep my trust in God. It's important that we always stay in need of him. It's, you know, with God being poor in spirit, you inherit the kingdom. Poor in spirit doesn't mean self-criticism and stuff like that. That's just stupid. Nobody come out of, you know, I'm just going to analyze myself and see how I'm doing. You're going to come out crying. Yeah. No, you, you, you go, you, you become poor in spirit where you're always hungry for God. So no matter what comes to you, what blessing comes, you are hungry for more. Okay. And in Samuel, I'm just going to tell you the story. In Samuel 15, 13 through 23, it's the story of Samuel coming back to Saul after he had had a command to kill every Amalekite, destroy everything in the camp. Samuel comes back late. Saul gets scared of the people. And keeps some of the spoil. Keeps the sheep and some oxen and some, the good stuff and the king. Now, let me tell you something. In the Old Testament, when a kingdom would invade another kingdom, the king would always be spared until he got marched through the town naked. That's what they would do. They would strip him of his clothes, march him through the town because he no longer had his kingly robe. It was a humiliation of his kingdom. And then they would kill him, chop his head off, his arms, and send it to different places. Well, God didn't want that to happen. Why? He didn't want Saul to take the glory. He wanted it done the way he wanted it done. This word sacrifice is the Hebrew word thysia, which means an offering, to the, an offering the Lord accepts because it's being offered on his terms. It's time we stop negotiating terms with God and just do what he says. You know, don't ask God to bless your plan. Find out his plan for you. Yeah? yeah. yeah? Amen. Eventually, we're going to learn if we want more of God, we're going to need to do it his way. Yeah. All right. So in this scripture, in the end of it, it says this. Because Samuel calls Saul out on the carpet and says, no. And Saul says, I did everything you told me to do. And Samuel says, then why do I hear sheep bleeding? In other words, why do I hear the sheep, uh, you know that. And why do I hear oxen lowing? Yeah. Because everything's supposed to be dead. Yeah. He said, I, and the thing is, when you are deceived, when you're in deception, you're no longer deceived. You're just in a cloud. And Saul thinks he did the right thing, but he didn't. And it goes in verse 22, it says, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For, the rebe for rebellion 
And if you notice in your Bibles, is as is italicized. That's put in there for readability. It won't be up there, but in your Bible it will be. For rebellion, you need to take is as out, and it says for rebellion, the sin of witchcraft. That's why teenagers, when they rebel, that's why Proverbs says, rebellion is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. We got to get unrebellious. We have to let go of rebellion because rebellion tries to control the situation. That's why it's called witchcraft because witchcraft is all about control. Okay. He goes on to say, because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he's also rejected you from being king. Psalm 8, 1 through 2. This is, a, this is a really good point here. I want you to get it. If it um, listen to this. Praising in advance stills the plans of the enemy. It confuses his plan because he can't understand the sacrifice of praise because he can't create or praise. You got to understand this about Satan. He is a branch, been cut off of trees. He's got a few green leaves left, but he's dying every day. He's been cut off from the sort. Satan is not the opposite of God. He's the opposite of Michael the archangel. He was a created being that fell from heaven because he disobeyed and tried to lift himself above the Lord. So you really need to get that. Yes, there is good and evil. But some people say, well, there's God and there's the devil. No, that's not true. There's God. Yeah. All God would have to do is flick his pinky and then the devil would be out of it. So the Satan has no creative power. He has no love. And he can't praise. So when you offer a sacrifice of praise in the midst of a trouble, in the midst of, and who's your help in the time of trouble, just like Psalm 46 said? He is. Yeah. When you offer that, you confuse the enemy because his only power is to speak to you. His only power is to say you'll never make it. Yeah. And when you say, I'm going to make it, yeah. God's good, he loves me, yeah. it, it destroys his plan. Now, in Psalm, right there in Psalm 8, in verse 2, it says this, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Amen. Why babes and nursing infants? They're innocent. We got two little, we got uh, Josie uh, is, is, I don't know, I don't, we're looking for her parents. Yeah, you know, I just kissed her little hands this morning, and she's just looking at me. And then Landon, uh, he's in the nursery. But, I mean, anytime Landon comes around, I never thought I'd be a baby guy. You know, I just, you know, I, mine grew up, and I don't hold him in my arms anymore. And I, I, I whatever. And then Amy's always, oh, I got to have a baby fix. I got to have a baby fix. And she'll hold the baby. And then every once in a while, she'll look back at me and say, you sure you don't want him? Baby, I'm fixed. I'm fixed. There ain't no, there's reversing, but this guy ain't reversing. I guarantee you that. It was too much of a traumatic experience when I went through it. I had a redneck doctor. <laughs> Halfway through it, he said, oh, crap. Hey, that's not good. That's not good. Not, not when, no, not for a man. Uh-uh. Not, anyway, I got to keep going. Let's get back to the word, Barry. So, but it says nurse infants and babes. Why? Because it's pure. You can become like a nursing infant and a babe in your thanksgiving and praise to God. Why? Because it's pure for who he is. Now, if you go to Matthew 21 and verse 15, it says, But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. See, <clears throat> when you walk in a lifestyle of complaint, you'll be indignant when other people give other people compliments. You'll be mad. You'll get ticked off. You won't like it. And he says, it goes on to say, Hosanna, the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, to Jesus, do you hear what they're saying? And I love Jesus. Yeah, I hear it. What's the problem? He said, yes. Have you never read? Now, I love it when Jesus does this, does this Pharisees, Sadducees, because they had to read. That was their life. They were always reading what Jesus was quoting, but they couldn't see the answer physically in front of them because they were blind because of tradition. So we can never be constrained by tradition. And he said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you, you have perfected praise. 
Jesus was quoting Psalm 8 too, but he left something out. Silencing the avenger and silencing the adversary. So perfected praise is when Satan can't talk to you. Satan can't offer you opinion. Why? Because it, it, it's if when you start praising and you're in the middle of a circumstance, it's almost it's like a knife in the back of Satan, and he has to get away from it. Imagine the worst thing that you shriek at, you run away from, you know, nails on a chalkboard or whatever it is. It just it just drives you crazy. That's what praise is to Satan because he can't understand, he can't compute what you're doing, and he has to leave. So the perfection of praise in Matthew is the stilling or stopping of the avenger in Psalms. Now, get this. Testimonies are praise and thanksgiving ammunition. I'm glad you all got that. <laughs> when, you, when you read a testimony, you know, Psalms 34, I think it's Psalms 34, it says, The humble will hear it and be glad. What? Hear what? The word of the Lord. Yeah. Do you know a testimony is the word of the Lord? Even if it's not written in the Bible, it's the word of the Lord. Why? Because it's telling the good things he did. So when you talk about a testimony or you go back with gratefulness, I, I think of my youngest daughter, Olivia. When we were in the wilderness, we were running from church to church doing youth pastoring, and we tried to pastor too early and did all this kind of stuff. And Olivia ended up coming down with pneumonia. She was in stage four pneumonia. She was in really, really bad shape. And we took her to, we ended up getting to Cook's Children's Center, a medical center. And Dr. Pfaff, I remember that they, uh, she was there for 10 days. And they saved her life. And I'm grateful for them. And that's when, in, in the midst of the time, I was having a faith struggle and using my kids as faith guinea pigs. Don't do that. Take my own experience. Don't do that. If you want to use you as a faith guinea pig, you do it. And I did it to me, too. I had another story about that one. I got a lot of stories. But she was in there, and then when we got out, there was about $23,000, $25,000 worth of a bill between four or five different places. And I wrote a letter to Cooks, told him where we were at, and financially, we didn't have insurance. We'd never had it. And, he, and uh, you know what? They sent me a letter back, and they said, we've gone to such and such department. We've decided to forgive all your debt. And if you send this letter to all the other places, they'll probably forgive it too. Did you know every one of those places forgave our debt? Praise yeah, praise God. And see, when I had something like that happen, and then I come up against a financial wall or a financial opportunity, I have no right to go to doubt and unbelief for my answer. Yeah. I'm going, I'm going to a linear source for the answer for the future when I need to go up and say, I remember when God did this. And when I do that, then I have faith for the future because praise and thanksgiving stills the avenger. You don't need the avenger stilled or silenced for the past. You need him stilled and silenced for the future. And so when I do that, I shut him up. The only power he has is the power I give him. You heard me say that I don't know how many times. And so when and then so when I do that, I put myself in a place of receivership. I put myself in a place to receive whatever God has for me. Get this. I was reading, I forget uh, what was it? Oh, Lord show me. Oh, I think it was Psalms. And it was talking about the walls are called salvation, but the gate is called praise. It was talking about a city we're, we're likened to a city, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. You know, we're likened to that a lot. Christians are. The walls are salvation. What, is, what do the walls provide in a, a fortress? They provide protection. They provide uh, the enemies can't get through. But what is a gate for? A gate is to go out and to come in. It's to go out and bring back the spoils of war. The gate is Praise. If we want to get, continue to stay in a place of salvation, we need to continually be in a place of praise. Oh, that's good. Because the gates open wide. Yeah. And he's got sharpshooters making sure nothing else slips in. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Yeah. Testimonies. The word testimony in the Old Testament, the root word of it is ud, U-D. You know what it means? Do it again. Do it again. 
You tell a testimony, it sets somebody else, it sets it up to do it again. Man, we got to do that. You know, we ought to sit around the next two weeks and just talk about the good stuff. Not the bad stuff, not the not making it, not the short checkbook, nothing. Oh, you remember when God did this, man? We were down to nothing. Baby, we had $25,000 in bills and God came through. You don't think that excites God? He's humble. God's humble. And when he hears it, he gets glad. Praise God, man. I was trying to think. I had another uh, thing, but I I think I want to move on. Because I really want to get to this one point. Next week we're going to talk about value and some other things, but let me make sure I'm doing the right thing. You know, um, I tell you my life experiences because I know them better than anybody else. I try not to talk about other people's experiences because I wasn't there and I didn't feel it. It wasn't wasn't real for me. When I get up at night, I I get up maybe a time or two if I drink a lot of water during the day, and I really try to focus on Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're really the only ones I talk to in the nighttime or that I'll just get up and, and it, look, it's, if it works for you, fine. If it doesn't, but every time my foot hits the ground, my toe touches the carpet, I begin to thank him. And then the whole time I'm doing something, <laughs> see, God can receive praise where others can't. <laughs> yeah. You didn't get that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Even when you're in the bathroom. So well, I got to get set aside. I got to be in my prayer closet. No, you can be in hunting blind and thank God. Trust me, I've done it, except on Sundays. <laughs> I just get that. I got a, a hunter friend over there that I was pointing at. But <laughs> praise Jesus. I needed another drink. Um, oh my Jesus! Now I got off again. What was I talking about? Why does this happen when we're streaming? I hope you enjoy this, huh? Yeah, praise Jesus. And it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing, man. You can always praise him for something. When you develop a a lifestyle of gratitude, you're going to have a lifestyle of magnitude. Thank you. They liked it. (laughs) You're going to develop a lifestyle of your life's going to get bigger. It's going to get better. You know, there's nothing better. To me, there's one of the greatest joys of my life is giving something special to someone and seeing the look on their face. That's payment. It's just, it's just awesome. Praise God. Let me make sure I didn't miss anything because I don't, I don't have much time left. Can we do this thing for two weeks? Next week, I'm going to knock your socks off with something. Well, God is. Through me. This story, it's so good. Oh, yeah, that's where I wanted to go. Okay. Last thing I, I, I kind of have for today. Make sure I didn't miss any other scriptures. Oh, that. Let me read the scripture to you for the gates and salvation thing. I just saw it. It was in Isaiah, not Psalms. It's Isaiah 26 1. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. I think this was the sons of Korah that wrote this psalm. We have a strong city. God will appoint salvation for walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter in. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Trust in the Lord forever for Yah, the Lord, is everlasting strength. Open the gates. Amen. That's good. All right. In John 6, in verse 11 through well, let's just, I got to cut just a little bit of time. Let me, let's just go there. John 6. This is a story of when Jesus fed the, the multitude with two, two fish and five loaves. And I love this story because it's, a, it's, you can use it on so many different levels. But right now we're talking about Thanksgiving praise, gratitude and such. Don't, don't ever say, when I have money in the bank, I'll be happy. When I have X amount of dollars in savings, then I can relax. Or when, when I have a bigger house, then things will be better. I'll be happy. Your happiness cannot be connected to things. 
Because if it is, when you get those things, you won't be happy. It'll be a temporal, it'll, temporal, it'll be a temporal fix. Kind of like drugs. It's only going to do so much so long, but then you come back. Yep. It's, it's only a short-term thing. And I know, I've been there, I've done it. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. See, God is excessive, but he's not wasteful. Yeah. This was excess. Yeah. John 10.10 10 says, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. That word more abundantly is parisos, which means super abundant in qual- quantity and superior in quality. Yeah. Look it up. Yeah. That's what that word means. That's the life you're supposed to be living. Yeah. So that nothing's lost. That word for basket there, remember when, when Paul was let down out of the city to get away from the guys trying to kill him? That's the basket they were talking about. It could hold a man. And 12 of those went back with that boy because of the seed he sowed. That's pretty good harvest. We just, Mama, we got dinner for at least a month. But the disciples despised it. But the boy had it and he gave it. But when Jesus closed his eyes and he held that, you see, you got to get your problem in the hand of Jesus. You got to get your seed in the hand of Jesus. Because when it's in his atmosphere, things change. And God, Jesus didn't close his eyes and, and thinking, boy, Jesus, God, you got to help me here. Because we got 20,000 people. You got to do something. Come on, Lord. What? Jesus, Father, I'm talking my own name. I'm so stirred up. You know, he's just, he's not thinking these things. He's going and he's saying, all right, Dad, what do you see? Okay, okay, I got it. He opened his eyes. He gave it to the disciples. You notice he didn't offer an explanation to them. I guarantee you before, he, before they started distributing the bread and fish, they had a committee meeting. And they's like, well, we've been with him when he did some strange things, but this is really strange. They're going to stone us. Peter, you go this way, I'll go this way. Maybe we'll get away from him before all this comes down. I'm telling you, they had stupid discussions. You know how I know? Because we've had stupid discussions. <laughs> and they, was just, they were just like us just like us but eventually they came around and they said all right we'll start handing out handing out and every time they gave part away it refilled every time they gave it just refilled until they had 12 baskets could hold a man left over a fish and bread the little boy took home as a harvest but the thing was Jesus saw he gave thanks for what hadn't happened yet he saw the victory before it happened He took his need, he took his situation. You got a problem or don't, I don't even say problem. I don't have any problems. I have opportunities, opportunities to get better, opportunities to overcome. You're called more than an overcomer in Christ Jesus. And so when you have an opportunity facing you, if you keep it in the atmosphere of doubt and negativity, doubt and negativity is what you'll get. But as soon as you say, well, I got a $150 bill and I got $15 to pay it. Well, evidently it's not going to pay the bill. So give it to Jesus. Put it in his hand. See what he can do with it. Because he multiplied five loaves and two fishes into feeding 20,000 plus people and leftovers. But what you do is you you put it in the atmosphere of heaven. You put your lack, you put your everything that in the atmosphere. And so you start surrounding yourself with the atmosphere of heaven. And the atmosphere that's in you will become the atmosphere around you. But if the atmosphere in you is doubt and unbelief, it's going to be what's around you. Yeah. Now, I'm going to prove this to you. There's a doctor in Glen Rose. He's a creation scientist, Dr. Ball. And uh, he did something really interesting. He took a hyperbolic chamber. It was a hyperbolic biosphere where the, uh, the oxygen content was at a super high level. Now, in the garden before the fall, it was a pure environment. That's why there was no sin, sickness, or death. Yeah. But Adam and Eve had to have a choice because you want to be chosen. You want to be chosen to be loved, not forced to be loved, yeah. right? God's the same way. Yeah. That's why when they tresgra- trespassed, when they said no to God and yes to the enemy, they were put outside the garden where it was cursed yeah. and no longer a pure environment. That's why they started to die. Yeah. I was looking at something really interesting. The ages of different patriarchs 
You know, Methuselah lived 100 and, or, uh, I'm sorry, 963, 969 years. Yeah. Noah, I think it was 950. See, they wouldn't have died. Adam would still be here today if he had expanded the garden instead of trespassing and getting outside of it. So, Dr. Ball had this hyperbolic chamber and put a copperhead. One of, I mean, copperhead is a nasty snake. All snakes are nasty snakes. The only good snake's a dead one. People have snakes as pets. I don't get them. I don't understand them. Don't ever bring a snake to me. I'm going to pull out a knife and kill it. But, you know, but he put a copperhead in there. And, you know, it's kind of funny. Poison. Adults know how to dispense poison to hurt just enough. But young people dispense more than is needed. Copperheads are the same way. Baby copperheads, you get bit by one, it's deadly because they unload all their venom. An adult copperhead does it in doses. But anyway, I don't know. I don't know why I said that. But anyway, he put this copperhead in there. And over the course of weeks, when he checked the copperhead, the venom, turned, the chemical composition of the venom turned non-toxic. Why? Because it was in a different atmosphere. And so when you saturate your atmosphere with praise and thanksgiving, the outside circumstances have no choice but to change. Yeah. Yeah. They have no choice but to shift states from venomous to benign. In fact, I think there's a word for somebody there. I think that <clears throat> I don't know if anybody's been diagnosed with any kind of cancer lately. But I'll just say in Jesus' name, it's turning from malignant to benign. I don't know if that means anything to anybody. We have to make sure the atmosphere for our future is praise and thanksgiving. We have to walk in gratitude. Man, I'm just, I just get, I'm grateful. I, and I'm going to become more grateful. And I'm not saying I've arrived, but I've left. I'm grateful for all you guys. I mean, we had a, a full last service. We got a full this service. I'm just, I'm grateful. And, but I see every service full. I don't preach to the empty seats. I preach to the full ones. You know? And God's, God's assembling a great company of people that are going to do great things for him. And you're part of those people. Amen. Say, I am one of those people. All right, praise God. We all stand. Um.